we are going to be live streamed. <laughs> and yeah, the questions. Yeah, yeah. How 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 should I spell your name correctly? I'm uh, not. Uh, I, I don't speak your mother tongue, Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Christian. Um, the the right way is uh, Yair. Yair, Yair. What is the meaning of the name? Will give light. Will give light. That's a great name. That's a great name. Thanks and so your second name, Ram. How do I spell it correctly in 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 Hebrew? Uh, that would be Reem. Reem. So there is yeah. a break. It's Yair. And Re-M. Correct. Re-M means uh, an oryx in Hebrew. Cool. <laughs> cool name. Great name. Great name. <laughs> and you are, you, you're based in Germany, basically, in Berlin. Correct. How so, comes that you moved from, from Israel to Germany? Because life is full of a sur surprises. So <laughs> <laughs> basically, I came uh, one year uh, for one year, and that is already uh, 14 years ago. <laughs> So I came to check uh, this uh, distance relationship with that I had uh, with my girlfriend back then, who was from Germany, mm -hmm. and it turned out to be a, a good one. Mm -hmm. So I uh, stayed, and we have two kids, uh, eleven oh, and nine years old, and time flies. Congratulations! Congratulations! Thanks a lot. <laughs> How is Berlin these days? Well, I think the city is changing and always for, for the better, but definitely being here already for 14 years, mm -hmm. you've, you've seen it through going through uh, the different cycles, uh, especially on the, on the innovation side, on the high tech side, on the real estate market. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been, it's been a while now. Yeah, yeah. Let's get into the topic of the podcast, your journey into the intersection of venture capital and climate tech with Extantia. Extantia, what is how do I spell the name of your fund correctly? <laughs> Extantia Capital. Extantia Capital. Uh, how did you uh, develop into the role of a venture capitalist? Uh, that's a very good uh, question. I mean, again, uh, like everything else uh, in life by chance. <laughs> um, in my background, so I always liked uh, playing and building things and uh, playing Lego. So I ended up studying electrical engineering um, and was an engineer for a while, uh, um, predominantly in the telecommunication uh, um, space. So I really like uh, technology. Uh, with uh, the move to Germany, as, as I just mentioned, I um, needed to decide what I want to do next. So it was uh, either joining a, or the, the first option would have been to join a startup. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, talking about the changes in, in Berlin back then, like almost 15 years ago in Berlin, there weren't a lot of uh, hardcore hardware B2B technology startups. This was around 2007, 2008, right? Correct, correct. Yeah, we, had, we had a bit of a financial crisis back then, so it was a really interesting Yes, time. And, and most of the stuff that was here was uh, Zumber Brothers back then, offline to online models, B2C, digital uh, less of uh, uh, hardware and B2B uh, topics. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up uh, eventually uh, getting to know uh, people at um, Hustle Plattner Ventures, uh, which was the investment arm of Hustle Plattner, the co-founder and chairman of SAP. Mm -hmm. And uh, started as an analyst um, that knew something about technologies. The fund was always looking at B2B topics. And ended up doing all kinds of roles over the following decade from, from analyst to investment manager to CFO and eventually uh, managing director of, of the fund. So that's kind of how I transitioned um, to venture capital. And why did you decide to go for climate tech? I mean, venture capital is in almost every high tech area. I have a background in life science, med tech, digital health, but there are also uh, space, space exploration, for example. What drew you to climate tech? Right. So uh, I, I think it's it's something that grows on you, right? It's not something that you wake up in the morning and you say, <laughs> okay, this is what I want Let's to do. Let's do climate tech. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I think over the years um, in, in venture capital, especially at House of Planner, most of the stuff that we were doing was software. Mm. So first of all, that was a little bit of strange for me because I'm a hardware engineer 
but I was actually doing a lot of uh, software investments uh, over the years uh, because of the connection also to, to SAP. So a lot of enterprise software, infrastructure software, um, a lot of uh, that. Um, but then here and there, we touched upon, upon uh, hardware topics. So for example, semiconductors um, and other things. And then when I joined, that was around 2010. Hmm. And basically these were still the heydays of CleanTech 1.0. So back then, uh, apart from doing software, uh, our mandate as a fund was also to do clean tech. And uh, therefore, at the time, we were looking at stuff. We did something also, and we looked at a lot of uh, things before in 2012. Things started uh, uh, basically uh, the, the bubble burst of, of the clean tech 1.0. Um, and with that, we learned uh, many lessons. So I think that was the first time that I actually started looking into the topic and understanding the dynamics of, of the market. But Extancia didn't exist in no. 2010 and 12. For no, that it was, was as part as, as Hustle Platinum Ventures. Extancia mm -hmm. is, we need another decade to, another to, decade. to, to what, get to Extancia. And, and when did you decide to form Extancia? So we decided to do that around 2019. Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, my partners and I have known each other for many years. Uh, one of the partners has uh, kids in the same age. And, you know, Kita is the kindergarten, is, is the best place to, to network without That's our parents. <laughs> Meanwhile, the kids are in school and they are independent. They go alone. They come alone. <laughs> so you don't interact with the parents as much as you used to do in the kindergarten. <laughs> And then you talk and you hear what the others are doing and, and the connections. And that's how we started talking about uh, with my partners uh, over the years, uh, um, basically to uh, what are you doing? What are these guys doing? And um, my partners started going into uh, uh, environmental uh, in investments or uh, in German, you say Umwelt Technologien, yeah, or some sort of clean tech uh, topics also around 2015, 16, into what today is, uh, is uh, uh, geothermal. That is, uh, that is today very <clears throat> widespread, but at the time it was very innovative and, and uh, initial. And through that, and I was also engaged in, in the topics, looked it into the into what was going on in North America. So basically, I think that after 2015, so maybe if we talk about clean tech, climate tech, I think that we had some kind of a dead period between 13, 12 and, and 15, 16, uh, because everybody was burned and a lot of billions were burned in, mm. in that round. Uh, so everybody were licking their wounds, but the topic remained. <laughs> Was so, this was this was this so such a hard time 2012 to 2015 16 that uh, really after the bu bubble burst people didn't want to touch uh, clean tech anymore? By all means, really. So there, there was no there was no capital available, and even as things started back in 2016, let's say 17, mm -hmm. and even when we started. In, in 2019, 2020, at the height of the pandemic, um, it wasn't clear that this is going to be what is it today. Yeah, the topic climate tech, the, the, the name climate tech was just being started back in 2020-ish. Mm -hmm. And what, how we think about it today is really the last couple of years. So, so basically... So you basically yeah. went with your partners into an area where everybody said no, <laughs> exactly. uh, without it invested. It. Why? Why, exactly. did you, why did you do that? I think, you know, it started with, uh, you know, you know. Sometimes I say it. Uh, it depends to whom I'm talking, right? So <laughs> <laughs> the, the, you know, it, it, at some point that, and this is when when you were talking about how you end up in climate, is that after doing a decade of software investments and which was great and with a lot of success, you ask yourself, okay, what do I want to do next? Mm -hmm. And for sure, I wanted to start my own fund and be an entrepreneur uh, and start, start something to scratch. And what is the one thing that I want to focus and spend my time? What is the one thing that I, over this decade of doing things, what was a lot of fun for me? So 
software is kind of ruled out going back to the roots of uh, of the of the hardware um but this and... sorry to drop it but this would have been the easy route because i remember software everybody up to 2020 wanted to invest in anything with software for sure and all my friends you know coming from israel all my friends are mm. in cyber security pretty yeah. much and and are doing very well um but i like the road not taken so mm. um maybe it's the, the harder one um, so that was maybe a, uh, one thing. And the other is, is definitely on something that is meaningful on, on a global scale. Yeah. And, and I think this is climate is, is definitely one of those oh, yeah. for sure. There are others like, like healthcare for, for example, or education. Now climate so, is definitely something that, uh, is very important for, I had recently a podcast with, uh, Dr. Kimberly Miner from, uh, Nazi works at NASA. And it was very eye-opening uh, comments on the state of the climate. So I think it's a very important factor. Yes, definitely. And and in this regard, I, I think that um, maybe the the beginning, the genesis was do good. Yeah, mm -hmm. we want we want to dedicate out our ourselves to something that we can really uh, uh, make a big difference, and maybe maybe also create a return. Um, and we will come to that maybe later in, yeah, in, in, the in, in the discussion. But pretty fast, we understood that there is a huge business opportunity here. And it's actually worth pursuing as a full-fledged venture capital. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of coming full circle uh, how I landed up in, uh, in, in, in climate, in venture climate, and also how we came together and thought, okay, this is worth pursuing. That's great. Let's dissect our podcast conversation into several parts. Let's start uh, first talking about your mission in climate change and what climate change basically is, how you view the problem as a fund. Then let's dive a little bit into the current political landscape, uh, how it, especially in Europe, how it helps or prohibits development in climate change. And then let's talk about... Uh, where you as a fund see the big opportunities. Mm. And uh, I got uh, aware of your uh, profile with your posts about cap tables, and I would mm. love to explore also this part with yeah. you uh, because it's uh, one part that founders usually don't talk about and don't have an eye on, but I think it's very important to have that covered if that's okay with you. Oh, sure. let's, let's start with the first part. Uh, your investment strategy with Extancia Capital, how do you contribute to the broader picture of climate change? So maybe maybe we should start a little bit earlier. It's it's uh, to understand the, the problem. And, and the problem is that we don't have time. Really? Um, is, uh, yeah, we're running out of time if we want to save the planet, so to speak, um, from the global warming and, and getting to stopping at 1.5 degrees or stopping at two degrees or stopping somewhere, then we need to change. And, and to change that would mean, and that's coming maybe later also to the, to the business opportunity, we need to fundamentally change everything we know. Everything, every, uh, unlike other things that we do, uh, uh, with cybersecurity or healthcare, yeah, it, it, these these are industries. Here, in order to reach the goal of of stopping the climate change, we have to change all industries. Every single item needs to change. The uh, the way this uh, computer is being manufactured, the way things we are wearing are manufactured, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is also where why hardware plays such a big role because at the end of the day, we're talking about molecules. CO2 is a molecule. Molecule is a physical item and you cannot just um, blockchain it away or, or SAS it away. <laughs> you <cannot. It's>, uh, <laughs> so you have to come. It can help, yeah. for sure, but it cannot be the, the entire solution, right? I mean, you we have cars that are running or planes or ships that are running on fuel, again, you cannot replace it with, with a blockchain. <laughs> blockchain, right? So you, you, you have to, write, to find other sources. Mm. And that's why most of the stuff that we're looking at is, 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 is hardware. So basically, in order to um, 
to do this, we need technologies. We need new solutions. Some of them, as we're looking today, are looking very trivial, but they were not a decade ago, right? So if we're looking, for example, we're talking about uh, solar panels or fuel cells or lithium ion batteries. Yeah, these all look like commodities today, but lithium ion battery was invented or came to the market the uh, first time in 1991. So basically at that time, that was an innovative technology. Now that means that it took these 20 years, 30 years in order to come to full scale in the market. That means that if we want to do something about climate, we have these next decade, the next two decades that we have to come with innovative solutions. Basically, the, the thing is that we have a carbon budget. Mm -hmm. Carbon budget is how much of CO2 or CO2 equivalents or green, let's say greenhouse gas emissions, right? Uh, because methane and others are also uh, uh, greenhouse gases emissions. Uh, how much of that are we allowed to pollute, to emit generally, if we want to stay below 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees? And the numbers vary, right? I mean, the good scenarios, bad scenarios, et cetera. But in all the scenarios, <clears throat> if we want to uh, um, do something, then we have to change the amount of emissions till the end of this decade, mm -hmm. if we want to stay below 1.5. And if we want to stay below 2 degrees, we have to reduce emissions uh, in the next 20 years. So that means that we don't have a lot of time. It means that all these technologies that we already have, we need to deploy them. We need to accelerate the deployment of those technologies. But the challenge is that those technologies can get us only halfway to net zero. So at mm -hmm. the end of the day, by 2050, we want to be at zero emissions or net zero emissions or almost zero emissions, right? What is almost zero? There are things that will still emit. Part of it is the natural cycle, but then we will have to compensate with something else, okay? So that it, we're talking about net zero. So everything we have today, the technology we have today, according to International um, Energy Association, um, are just good to take you halfway. So there is a lot of technology that needs to be there, but is still not there. And it's not like it's not invented usually. So it's not like we need to do pure R&D, pure science, but we need to scale it. And we need to bring it into a position that it is ready for mass market. And ready for mass market is means that it's at a price point that is ready for it to scale. And we can talk about that also about that later, also when we talk about political landscape, etc. But that boils down at the end of the day, long story short, is that we need a lot of technology innovation in order to beat climate change. And that is why Extancia here. Extancia here is a venture capital because the, the um, asset class that is responsible on the on technology innovation historically is the one that has pushed technology innovation is venture capital. Mm -hmm. And we believe that you need a fund that is dedicated to the topic that is climate first in order to think how do you do things uh, the right things first, and then naturally with the VCIs to scale and not do the other way around, like the generalists, that you first invest and then you color it green. Uh, and sometimes it's light green, sometimes it's dark green, but it's not necessarily moving the needle. I mean, if we look mm -hmm. backwards 20 years, what has been done, where venture capital historically invested, um, then you see it's a lot of that is mobility. But mobility mm -hmm. is just maybe 20% of the problem. Okay, so it was basically Tesla uh, cars, electric cars. Uh, that exactly. Were, uh, electric focus. cars is uh, electric electrification of mobility, let's say. Yeah, did they, did, they, did they get it right? So basically, if we uh, 
deploy all technology that we have to fight climate change today, we still have a gap of 50% to right. make up. So we cannot uh, tackle the entire problems with the existing technology. Right. Uh, to bridge that gap, the 50% gap, someone needs to deploy capital to motivate scientists to develop new solutions and motivate developers to develop the solutions then to the market and motivate uh, companies with market access to scale the deploying deployment of this uh, technology. My question to you is, I mean, you mentioned blockchain. So for example, uh, if blockchain fails, with currently, I think, the Fed and the SEC is investigating and tries to shut down or put down some things, I mean, if blockchain really fails, it's it's bad probably for micro strategy with uh, a lot of Bitcoin are at 46 billion, but uh, the human race won't go extinct because blockchain is not there. Uh, what's the scenario if uh, climate tech fails? If we say, okay, we don't do it, we don't invest in climate tech, what would be the outcome for the human race? Well, I, I don't think that the human race is going to be extinct, but but uh, the world as we know it will change mm. massively. Uh, basically, the implications of even half a degree uh, warming is that a lot of the stuff that we know is, is going to change. The coral reef, the, the biggest example is that the coral reefs are going to be extinct altogether. And that in itself is going to start ripple effects to uh, affect on nature. And uh, basically with um, with warming uh, temperatures, we'll see multiple effects. Uh, let's take agriculture, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, crops yields are going to go down significantly. Uh, so less food to feed the planet. So more hunger. Um, and I'll, uh, maybe one point on that in, in a second. Um, infrastructure, hurricanes that we see, fires. So infrastructure is, is going to be hit. Roads, electricity, um, the coastline, the, the water is, uh, levels are going to rise up. Um, and the most important that I want, I want to emphasize is that there is a lot of social inequalities here. So basically, the developing world is going to be hit much harder than the developed world. And that is very unfortunate. And that in itself will trickle down because we will see much more uh, massive immigration waves. So mm -hmm. everything we see today in the Mediterranean, th this is like uh, um, a preview, small preview of what we're going to see if millions of people will have to um, will have to migrate. Yeah, so that in itself is going to do a lot of debates, not to say local wars, etc. So I don't want to picture a doomsday, uh, but definitely um, it's going to be very very different than than what we, as we know today. Mm -hmm. No, I think the migration, probably, uh, when I look at the newspapers these days, I think a cultural clash is already there. And if you scale it up uh, and don't do it a little yeah. bit more smoothly, uh, yeah. probably as also effect. Um, is half is half a degree such a such, such a huge difference in your opinion? It, it is. It, I mean, it's uh, it's definitely there. There are very nice tables that show that everything, which types of birds are gonna mm. uh, vanish from the ecosystems. And as you know, I mean, this is not about necessarily about the single species that that is extinct. This is more about the um, ecosystem effect that that is happening. Mm. I mean, there, there are two ways to tackle the problem then, in my opinion. So one way is uh, just prohibit traveling. You say, please stay at home. You are not allowed to purchase anything anymore uh, except what you need so that you drive down consumption and less travel and less uh, logistics. And the other side is uh, technology and innovation. In your opinion, what's the role of technology and innovation? What's the con uh, contribution that we bridge that gap of 50 percent how much impact will it have right so let, let, let's let's start with uh with what, what you, you just said i mean there is there is a behavioral change and mm -hmm. there is technology innovation now 
it is not that we don't believe that we should all be more global uh, uh, citizens of the world and good corporate uh, citizens. Yeah, we we have to. We have to think more about how we consume things. Do we need to consume everything that we consume? Can we recycle? Do we really have to fly for our next vacation? Um, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we have to be better consumers and more responsible consumers. This will come. Mm -hmm. The impact of that is estimated at getting to net zero, maybe 10%. The challenge is that as much as we want to, not the world is not going vegan. Okay, people are not going to stop flying. If you look at the uh, the Paris um, air show that just ended, it was announced that all the airline company, uh, the the OEMs, the Boeing and, and and Airbus are booked out for the next thirty years or so, in terms of plane deliveries. So people are not going to fly, uh, uh, stop flying, and people are not going to consume it. And you know what? It may not be an equal and just demand to say, hey, middle classes in developing countries, now that you're, you're finally middle class and you can allow to consume it, you're not allowed to. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is not necessarily a just uh, um, transition. And we have to make sure that the transition is is ju makes justice to to everybody. So, I believe that it's more on us again. Coming back to techno the technologists in in the room is to come up with solutions that enabling life, uh, but are more sustainable to the planet. So that we can continue with the growth, and growth is not necessarily a bad thing, but it has to be decoupled from pollution. It has to mm. be sustainable growth, green growth. And, and I'm sure that with the right solutions, we can definitely go in the right way. Um, we need to find maybe a cultured meat that is, uh, that is very similar to meat. Maybe we need to... Uh, invade uh, cows that don't burn and fart uh, anymore. <laughs> so um, airplanes that that are clean, be it sustainable mm -hmm. aviation fuel, be it hydrogen-based planes, and, and you name it. Yeah? But it's about us to find the solutions because it's very, very difficult to rely on human race or human nature to, to change. Yeah, I think if that's possible. I mean, I often thought about uh, when I look at Europe, for example, flying. Um, I mean, before 1989, um, when I look back in history, uh, World War II, World War I, so Europe was the battleground over centuries, basically. It was uh, built on badland. With 1945, it changed. And I think it tremendously changed after 1989, after the Cold War was over. And in my opinion, this uh, possibility of many people traveling across Europe from east to west, north to south, uh, made people talk to each other. And when they talk to each other, they learn to understand each other. And when they understand each other, they have less intention to fight against each other. And uh, sometimes I think when we prohibit traveling and we turn that down, maybe it goes the other way around then and uh, in a direction that I don't want to go back. Right. Um, I also believe that tech uh, plays a crucial role, but the the, the question I have to you now is: uh, I mean, is it really just uh, the companies that have to do something, or does politics also play a role in that game? What's the role of politics in your opinion? For sure, I mean, without politics, again, this this is probably one of the most complex topics uh, <laughs> out there. It usually. <laughs> And usually number one in, in, in a VC advice is never start a company in a highly regulated market. <laughs> so this is a very regulated market. Mm. So we're acting against the advice. But hey, if we don't do it, then, then nobody's going to do it, so to speak. Right. So we have to do it. Um, but definitely. So, so I think that without politics, without the regulator, nothing will happen. Mm. And in this regard, uh, because the, the private market 
again, um, and we, will, we can talk about that also later, but it's, it goes all back to money. So in order to move something, it's sorry for being the capitalist for a second, but, but um, it's all about making money. And if the private market doesn't identify the business opportunity in something, mm -hmm. just because of scaring people with the coral reef and the birds being extinct, nothing's going to happen. Uh, there are so many statistics uh, about it and behavioral uh, uh, psychology that talks about if you want to motivate people for action, you have to, so, to show good things rather than uh, uh, color them uh, in black uh, colors, right? So you have to show the opportunity rather than the um, the, the challenges, right? Um, so in that in that in that case, you have to make the private market move. So the private market is all about money, mm. and in order for the private market to move, you have you need to have the regulator. So that is why the decisions that the regulators, that countries are taking. Um, that is why the discussions, the, the COP discussion or every, uh, the IPP, um, IPCC uh, reports, these are all super critical um, in order to start the moving of countries in this direction and basically taking decisions or pledges to reduce emissions and then with carrots and sticks to navigate through this uh, transition. When I look at the, uh, the latest moves from regulators that I'm aware of, uh, I think Biden has uh, put some policies in place, um, several trillions, I think. It's uh, huge climate funds. Mm -hmm. And also the European Union has... Uh, um, I think put out uh, a green right. deal. How do you see the influence of uh, public capital flowing into the market? Does it replace private capital or does it uh, add value to the entire ecosystem so that you can just do more faster, better and quicker? Right. So again, again, to answer that, uh, I will have to start with something before. <laughs> um, basically, I think that as, as said, what we want to achieve is the fact that uh, goods and processes, the way we do things today, we will continue doing them, but in a more sustainable way. So in a way that is not polluting as much CO2 or other greenhouse gases uh, to the air as we do today. So basically, the thing is that, and this is the interesting part of it, is that the solutions exist, right? I mean, the we can find ways how to tank our airplanes in a, in a sustainable way today. We can uh, uh, do uh, textiles which are fair and uh, have no uh, GHG emissions, et cetera, et cetera. The challenge is that most people don't want to pay the price for it. It's such that the sustainable solutions are usually more expensive than the gray or black or non-sustainable solutions. There are several reasons for that. Let's The, the non-sustainable solutions have been perfectionized over the last 150 years, yeah? the entire industrial revolution. All the, yeah, if you look at the oil-based products, gas-based products, this has been uh, uh, perfectionized for now already more than 70 years. So it's not by chance that these the prices are now really, really, really cheap. And especially we were just mentioning earlier about the just transition and, and social inequalities. You cannot come now to people in developing countries and tell them, okay, you know, we in Berlin, Mitte, we buy now uh, meat that is cultured at five times the price, you guys should do the same. This is just, it's not fair, it's not just, and it's not going to fly. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to happen. So basically, if the sustainable solutions would have been at the same price or cheaper, 
than the non-sustainable solutions, then we would see a shift. Because again, we said it's all about money. So people care, you know, if it's price or climate, you know, it's not always clear, right? Or let's put it that way. For most people, it's the price because that people also true. think short term, right? So, and in irrational. So, so basically what we need to do, basically the task is to take technologies that are sustainable, but today they are more expensive and get the price down to a price parity with the uh, high emitting solutions. Now, this can be done in two ways. One is for the re regulators to increase the price of pollution. This is like tax, uh, carbon tax, for example, so that if you're polluting, you're gonna pay more. So if you're using coal, then the price per kilowatt hour is higher. Okay, so we're starting to close the gap. And the second is that technologies that are today um, rudimentary or nascent, right? We will scale them so that with the scale, this premium that you have today will be closed down and actually may go down even further. I'll give you an example. So for example, um, if we look at solar prices, the price of uh, solar electricity a decade ago was four times more than coal. Today it's cheaper. So today it's not economically, it's more economically viable to have solar than coal. Now you have to solve the problem of storage, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of the price, it's a game changer. People are now deploying solar panels, not just because they want to do good for the planet, but it's good business. Mm. Yeah, it's much more attractive. And this is where we need to go with all those technologies, basically. And that's why the regulator and what the regulator is introducing in these carrots and sticks, and I can give an example in a second, um, are crucial in order to help us close this gap. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, human nature. Human nature, it's uh, really challenging to yeah. accept short-term sacrifices for long-term gains, especially when the long-term gains are not that clear. I mean, when uh, I listen to you, I think half a degree, what's the huge difference in that? But when I have to pay more now, for example, electricity, I mean, uh, currently in Austria, in certain parts of Austria, uh, the price per kilowatt hour is uh, 0.67 cent. Um, two years ago, it was below 10 cent. Right. And people do care then and say, okay, why, why do I pay so much? <laughs> why do I pay so much? It's unfair. And they quickly then shift to the cheapest opportunity on the market. And if you say it's solar, uh, then it's clear that they say, okay, I mean, instead of paying this high price, I just uh, install solar panels on my roof if I have one um, and go with it. I think this is a, a very clear and understandable way. But um, where is the opportunity now for startups and investors in that game? I mean, basically, it's very much regulated, politics driven, so they can drive the prices up and drive the prices down, which uh, I think in uh, might have some... Uh, uncertainties uh, so one year it can be up one year it can be down that you see the opportunity for investors in startups that, that's that's a very good point <clears throat> and before we go to the actual uh, uh topics but i think that what's very important and, and you know the gray hair that i have just means that i've seen clean tech 1.0 uh <laughs> is that we should not rely in this regard on the regulator yeah mm -hmm. the the incentive, the subsidies, one day they are there and the other day they are not there. If they are there, it's good. But what we, we, we look at and, and, and the companies and how we work with them, all of those companies need to be um, financially viable. The business models need to be economically viable even without the subsidy. Mm. So basically, we want to see a pathway with all of them starting high, yeah, as I said, they start expensive, but as they, they scale, 
we want to see them going down to be financially attractive in themselves. Now, if the regulator steps in, it might accelerate this path. It might help us close the gap faster. But even without that, we should be able to, um, to become financially attractive. And, that, and that's on the volatility of, of the regulator. Though I must say that I think Europe is probably more stable than the United States. Uh, where things with one administration can change to the other administration. Um, but uh, whereas in, in Europe, it's it's slower, yeah. But when the train leaves the station, usually these things are not completely uh, revised later. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it must be a demand. I mean, what you say is... Uh... I think it's that the the demand for any industry it must be otherwise it's not sustainable. So if we cannot reach the point where consumers pay for the best tech a low and affordable price, I think it's really difficult to motivate regions outside European jurisdictions to implement the same solution. Because I mean, in Europe you can regulate it and say, okay, now you have to use it and we subsidize certain areas, but I don't see a spillover effect, for example, into other countries outside the European Union if the price simply stays high and it's just subsidized. So I think this is a very important point that the end goal of any new development in any industry that starts with, of course, subsidizing because otherwise you don't get it off the ground. But the end goal must always be, it must be economically viable and sustainable and without this economic viability it doesn't become sustainable exactly and 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 that's why when we look at stuff the the economic viability is is one thing that we're is very important for us so when when we're investing it's not just about about and um how big the impact is in absolute terms but also when is this impact and what is the size of that impact, right? So um, what is the time for impact? Can you get something done within this decade or it's gonna take you three decades? Mm-hmm. Yeah? Um, I give you an, an, an example in this regard. So um, nuclear uh, energy, if we're looking uh, um, on fusion, so a lot of stuff is being done in fusion, and I think this is very good. And a lot of more money should go towards innovation in fusion because one day it's going to be probably the energy source that is where it's all going to live from, uh, probably together with geothermal. But um, it's going to take many, many, many more years. Okay, like decades more. Mm-hmm. One thing. The other, if we look at nuclear fission energy that has been with us for the past 70 years, this is still by far the most expensive source of energy. So assuming that fusion will come in and immediately it will be also uh, uh, cheap is probably wrong. Mm. Uh, and, and, And that's why when we're looking at it, it's like, okay, this is probably not where we as venture capital should invest. Maybe this is still an R&D topic. This is something for governments to invest or high net worth individuals to invest in. But it's not, it's still R&D. It's still pure mm-hmm. science. It's not ready for acceleration with a venture capital fund. So basically without uh, the governments and the regulators, uh, I mean, it's the same in the pharma industry. I mean, basic science wouldn't basically exist anymore. Let's, exactly. let's just face it. And exactly. Without basic research, we don't get the innovation. I mean, of course, companies are also innovative, but they think, I think the nice thing of universities is that people really can focus 100% of their time on pure basic research and that this is an asset. All right. There is no time pressure. When we're investing, there is time pressure. <laughs> <laughs> there is... And and we may not want it because because you know things take longer in also mm. in hardware. But at the end of the day, and again, we are coming back that venture capital is, or generally, it's it's about capital markets. And our yeah. investors, we take money, and they have alternatives. They and some of them are pension funds, 
And pension funds uh, are, by definition, they are uh, collecting money from people, mom and dad, that are savings. Mm. And they have a fiduciary duty to generate the best return for them. So now they need to decide where to put their money and generate the best return. So should they put it in uh, stocks, in bonds, or in venture capital that is doing cybersecurity? Mm. Or should they do that in, uh, in a venture fund that is doing climate? And if they do that, yes, they want to do, do good for the climate, but they have to return money. So we have a time pressure. We have to create a return to our investors. And we cannot just say, oh, come back in 30 years and we may give you something. Then, Thank you. Then, we, then the problem is that I may raise money, but I won't raise it from the pension fund. And that would be a shame because the big money is that can make a difference is the institutional investors. It's the sovereign wealth Absolutely. fund, it's the insurers, it's the pension fund. And we need to, uh, uh, we cannot tell them, hey, stop investing in coal, you know, uh, and, and everything that is polluting. Now store everything in cash and don't put the money to work in something else. We have to create green financial products so that they can divert their capital. And that's why as Extancia, one of our first missions when we started was to be um, um, an investor that is an institutional grade investor that helps to shift that type of capital. That people can say, ah, it's not like we don't have an alternative. No, you have an alternative. Here it is an alternative. And we need to help build more of those alternatives. And we need to speak the institutional uh, language. And that probably means that I need to write 100 policies, despite that we are just 10 people. <laughs> because I have to be ready for this type of money with all the gorilla weight that they are coming with. Yeah. But if we won't do that, they will not be able to take the money out of the polluting stuff. So we have to create, it's all about shifting capital. Mm -hmm. that, that's the story of climate change, shifting capital. Yeah, and the capital is available. Now, thanks for pointing that out. It's a discussion I very often have with startups and also with, with, with other investors that at the end of the day, if you want to tap into the big pockets, you need to create returns. Exactly. And when I look at the landscape here in Europe, my personal opinion is you mentioned pension funds. Uh, they could do more in Europe, basically. And compared to the United States, for example, where I think in venture capital, a lot of money is flowing from uh, endowment funds, pension funds, and all these uh, big entities into venture capital, because I think the, the United States have a clear picture on if I invest, of course, I need a return at the end of the day. Often when I talk with founders here in Europe, and I say, look, I mean, when you present the case, you must make sure that the investor gets a minimum of 10% per right. year annual return because the alternative is always the S&P 500. You right. can always invest exactly. in the S&P 500. Berkshire creates 20% sustainable returns since the 1960s. And when I pension funds look at this and say, look, I mean, I can give Warren Buffett more capital or I can give it to a startup and the startup says, yeah, we're doing good for the world, but don't create any returns ever. I mean, the decision is clear. Yes, exactly. Full stop. <laughs> yeah. So we, it's good to emphasize that. But let's let's get a little bit back to the to the to the regulators. Uh what is the impact of these policies that we mentioned before on Extancia? Did you see an impact in your investment strategy? For sure. I mean First of all, we we try to stay atop on on top of all the policies, and there, there are a lot of them. But, but let's take the United States, uh, um, the U, um, the U, um, the EU, and UK, uh, the Nordics. Yeah, these are the main areas where where mm -hmm. we play. And what and what we see is twofold. As I said, we see carrots, and we see uh, sticks. Stix is more of, of the carbon uh, uh, tax that is rising over time that the corporates that are polluting are understanding, okay, hmm, this is going to be expensive. If we're going to do business as usual, uh, we will no longer be competitive because the it's, it's the same as the, with the price of energy. What happened with the price of energy surge, 
all the margins were eroded. So companies stopped being uh, um, economically viable, mm. uh, profitable. So that is, that is basically the same. If your COGS is growing because of the tax, then, then you're no longer making a profit. So they, need to, they understand that they need to do different stuff differently. On the other side, these, there are the carrots. And the carrots are, and I'll give them a concrete example, are stuff that are making the products of our companies more attractive now. Because nobody, again, not the individual consumer and not the corporates, they like to pay more. It's it's always have, we have the same discussions. It's like they ask our companies, okay, uh, how much CO2 uh, you reduce with this? Oh, this is great. But you do get, we do get it for the same price, right? So no, th- nobody wants to pay more. So if the regulator is now giving some subsidies, this helps us accelerate those this reduction and i'll mm. give you one example so hydrogen everybody's talking about the hydrogen economy um and what hydrogen and, and for good reason i mean today hydrogen most of it um, is being used for creation of uh, ammonia so basically you take nitrogen together with hydrogen and in a chemical synthetic process that was invented over 100 years ago by Haber Bosch process, a famous German duo, uh, basically you can create uh, ammonia, which is used as fertilizer, and feed the world. Half of the population in the world would not have existed without synthetic ammonia. And that's where uh, uh, hydrogen is used today. The, for the creation of this hydrogen, you're using steam methane reform. Basically, uh, it's it's a method that is using a lot of heat, and therefore you're emitting a lot of CO two. So roughly one point five percent of global emissions today are coming from the production of uh, hydrogen and green and, and, and ammonia. Now, to replace that and to use hydrogen as a carrier for renewable energy, as a carrier. Uh, to fuel cars and many other things that you can do with with the hydrogen, you need a lot more of that. Hydrogen can, if you deploy hydrogen at scale, you can probably replace good 10% of global emissions. Now, here is the problem. You cannot do that in the gray method, right? I mean, you cannot do it with the emissions. That's not the sense. But with the emissions today, the price is roughly $1 a kilo, between $1 to $2 a kilo. If you want to do it in a green way, and a green way is a way that is producing hydrogen without emissions. Most of the time, we're talking about taking the H from H2O, from water, Mm. in an electrolysis process using as a feedstock a renewable energy today the price for that is anywhere between 2.5 to 6 dollars a kilo so let's say there is a spread but between two times to four times more expensive now the biden administration introduced the inflection reduction act that among other things is introducing a subsidy. And again, it depends on the, on the use case, but you can get as a subsidy three up to $3 per kilo. Now, you remember the, the spread, it was 2.5 to six. So if you were anywhere between, uh, let's say four minus three, now you're at one, now you're competitive. Mm-hmm. If you were at three, and you're minus three, all of a sudden there is free hydrogen, green hydrogen, or you're actually making money, more money. Yeah. So it's a game changer. It's, 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 it's completely changes the, the industry and makes it much more lucrative for entrepreneurs to go into this topic and take nascent technologies and start deploying them faster at scale because they can make money. There is a case. And, and that's these type of things are those that are making a game changer um, in, in the market. 
When we look at the intersection of uh, public and private sector, then uh, I think what, from what I understood from what you said is that on one hand, we need it for basic research so that we get more innovation. On the other hand, we need the regulators to uh, help companies uh, um, operate profitable in areas where it's not possible yet. But this leaves me one question open then, how can we make sure that the profits that are flowing in the industry then are used to drive the costs down and reinvest it in improving the process rather than just pulling it out of the process and uh, use it otherwise? That that's a very good question, and I'm not sure that I have the. Uh, <laughs> I the was answer, hoping for, <laughs> but I, I I think that what we see now is that that's where the regulator mm. also steps in. I mean, uh, there is this uh, in several countries in the European Union and, and also elsewhere. Um, these uh, windfall or what is they called uh, um, profits? Windfall profits, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I think those are being taxed because because of the energy crisis. There are a few companies that make the killing, <laughs> where uh, the others, uh, as consumers, had to pay to make these uh, unusual profits, and that's where the regulator steps in and says, "Okay, this is not normal. This should be taxed and go back." To, um, to the circle. Mm. So I think that where we will see that things are misused, yeah? maybe some will manage to get away with it, but overall, I think the, um, the regulator will step in. Yeah, it was an interesting development in the last year in the energy sector in Europe. I mean, from what I observed last year, the narrative was that the energy sector is close to failing because of high cost. And a year later, when I look at the balance sheets, many of these companies who said that they're close to bankruptcy now have uh, tremendous profits in the bank account where I say, okay, where's the justification for the high price? Yeah. So, so I'm take the airlines, uh, Lufthansa, which was mm. pretty much bankrupt because of the pandemic, yeah. and was saved by the government, uh, is now flourishing, but they pay back every, every cent, right? So... Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky topic. So it's, it's an ongoing topic. it's an ongoing <laughs> game. I think let's let's go back. I'm, I'm to... just an engineer. I, I, I don't understand <laughs> anything of this. <laughs> I have I have a business background. So with uh, I mean tax taxing windfall profits or how we call it in German Übergewinn is a is a mm. tricky topic, um, because when companies in a jurisdiction generate or have the fear that uh, whatever they do when they're profitable and have the potential to reinvest, somebody steps in and takes it away. They It's easy for them then to move the company somewhere, for example, to the US or to, right. to Latin America or to Africa right. or to Asia. So tapping at the end of the problem into the result is much more tricky and difficult than just doing something at the beginning, like uh, price fixing, for example, on the right. market, when you see you have these uncertainties uh, to create stability. But it's a, I think this is a topic for an entire yeah. entire episode on its own. <laughs> Let's go back to your funds, to Extancia Capital. Um, when I think we, we talk about pension funds, so let's assume I have a pension fund, which I don't, but let's just assume it for the for the <laughs> exercise. Uh, why should I invest in you? What's What's your unique approach? Oh, that's a very big question. Um, so basically, I, I think it's a combination of many things. Um, at the end of the day, all of the answers should lead to the fact that, that I believe that we as a fund can generate the return mm -hmm. that they need and do uh, uh, good for the, for the climate. And maybe we'll talk about it in a second, but these are not two different things that are coming together. Um, now, the question is how we do that. And I think the answer for that is with a lot of hard work. <laughs> so if there is one thing I learned about venture capital, this is not like gambling. It's not, or the investment part of doing the investment, investing part of venture capital, that's the easy part. Mm -hmm. Making money is hard or getting that money back. <clears throat> and that means that whenever we invest or before we invest and when we invest, that's really where the hard work starts. So there is that's, a lot. 
Sorry. Let's let's sorry to interrupt. You. Let's talk about your hard work of investing. I mean, uh, after what um, Apple, for example, Apple is uh, past three trillion mark on the market, and now everybody knows that Apple is a success. Um, when I look back ten years earlier, uh, around 2010, 11, 12, it was the time when Steve Jobs died. Um, and when I look at uh, the articles in the press, uh, they were not talking very highly about Tim Cook back then. So a lot of articles out there say uh, Steve Jobs is dead and how can Tim Cook take over? There is no visionary anymore and the company will eventually definitely fail. Uh, now we know that Tim Cook is an excellent uh, CEO. He has, uh, I think uh, Apple had a market cap of 600 or 500 billion 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now we have 3 trillion. Um, but before knowing this, this is a sound investment, stepping in in a turnaround situation, in a crisis situation is tricky. How is it in your sector? What is your hard work? How do you identify such opportunities? Uh, how much companies do you see per year to do so? Uh, many. So we're, in, we're above a thousand. We crossed that mark already a few quarters ago. Um, a thousand <clears throat> companies in a year? Yeah. Wow. But... Uh, in the first half year only. Uh, what do what do you mean? It's over uh, over a year. Yeah. So every quarter we see over two three fifty three hundred companies every every quarter. Every so, quarter, and, so and the number is actually growing. Yeah. So this is one one company per day, basically. A little bit this, more. Two companies. Yeah, well, that's why we have a big team. Yeah. <laughs> and. Um, because there is, uh, unlike any other VC in, in, in the generalist one, there is a lot of knowledge that, that is needed here. Um, about 70% of the stuff that we see is related to chemistry. So we have a head of science that she is PhD chemistry and helps us to basically with her and, and her network of academics to assess those companies. And, and differentiate between those companies. Um, we have a professor of uh, life cycle assessment that helps us do all our carbon math. We can talk about that also. Mm. <clears throat> um, and basically to be able to say whether the impact and the technology is gonna be big enough. <clears throat> now, naturally we also look at, uh, at the market, at the team, like any other venture capital uh, firm. That's that's a lot of work then, I guess. For sure. How much time do you spend with a company before you make an investment decision? It depends. <clears throat> there are, I, I think it's anywhere between uh, months to years. So we have, I think the fastest was probably, I don't know, uh, six months or eight months. Um, and the longest is probably two to three years that we've known the company we've known the founders we they were not ready in our perspective um and then with uh, a lot of mutual work basically over the years we've seen how they're making advancement till the point in time that we say okay now it's the time to invest this is always the question i get from founders when when they ask uh, should i reach out to investors only when i am fundraising and when i'm the perfect fit for the investor <clears throat> Or should I start building relationships early? What's your take on that? You said the longest investment was uh, three years so that you observed the company for three years. But what, what's your preference? Very clear. Always reach out <clears throat> early, always build relationship. This is um, generally, it's the worst time to raise money is when you need money. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> the best time to raise money is when you don't need money. Companies that are doing well mm -hmm. and don't need money are flooded with inbound interest from investors begging to put their money into those companies. Companies who are with their heads to uh, with our uh, backs to the wall and are running out of capital, nobody wants to touch, or they will get really bad terms. So mm -hmm. naturally, it, it's it's a balance. But it's it's a relationship, and at the end of the day, it's a people's business. Mm -hmm. So, and we will spend a lot of time together. 
So you better build that relationship over time. So when the right time comes in, then you can skip that part, you know each other, and you can talk really on what matters. Yeah, I think this is probably one of the points why investing is so hard, because uh, when you look at the life experience of most people, they are not investors, and uh, then they become investors uh, over time. But usually the training in school is transactional. So you ask for money when you need it. You ask for a pay raise when you need it. Uh, you pay when you need it. Uh, you buy something when you need it. And investing is a lot different. So it's uh, it's not so much transactional. Right. And and I think you know the, 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 there is the all this exercise about a monkey choosing uh, stocks. <laughs> So uh, I would never say that we're the smartest in picking companies, mm. right? Mm. I mean, we're doing our best to pick the right companies that we believe that we, that can be winners. But uh, we can probably uh, <clears throat> we probably cannot beat the odds of the venture capital industry. I think what's important is not about picking winners; it's about making winners. So after we do the investment. That's what I was referring to. Really, the hard work really starts. It's about uh, rolling up sleeves and uh, on both ends and basically side by side, making sure that this company <clears throat> has the best chances to be successful. Let me ask you one question at this point, because if I'm interested now, uh, what is your hard work that you contribute? I mean, uh, Warren Buffett, for example, says, uh, I deploy capital, you do your work, and that's it. Uh, what is your process after the investment? What makes so you unique? I, I, I think that th there is a huge difference between uh, Warren Buffett business, private equity, mm -hmm. uh, and, and venture capital. There is a huge difference between a real estate uh, in a topic and, um, and, and again, venture capital. I, I think that you barely read in the press that, I don't know, Blackstone or uh, real estate developer, Bauvens, you know, they started whatever, they invested in a project or a company. And because of that, maybe, maybe Warren Buffett had that halo. Because of that, you think, wow, what a great company. And because mm -hmm. of that, that company is actually going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy is going to be successful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Coca-Cola is not successful because of Berkshire Hathaway, uh, just because they bought a big share. In the venture industry, it's different. If Sequoia is, or Andreessen, tier one companies are investing in a certain company, people start saying, oh, this is an interest company. Corporates say, oh, this technology has been vetted. So they buy it. So in turn, mm -hmm. indeed, that company is becoming successful. So the self-fulfilling prophecy of winners are making winners and becoming again winners is, is very different in, in the venture industry. That's and an that's why... When we come in, we work very hard in order. We know that if also if we're going to be successful as a firm, that in turn is going to help us in the future to become more successful. But <clears throat> not just because of the ripple effects or the um, this cycle of of effects, but also because <clears throat> as we get better, as we get bigger, we have the resources or the networks to make this happen. So, for example. You, you ask about how we help, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a network of service providers that work with us that all of our companies are going to. So for, for example, a, a recruiter that is specialized in the energy market that we're active in. So almost every company we invest in is going through that, that guy or, or that firm because they know us, they know the needs, they have a pool of resources. And in return, we get really the best uh, uh, people to, to our companies. And, and this is, goes the same in other topics. Um, uh, marketing agencies, PR agencies, uh, branding agencies, right? So um, 
Um, in our topic, uh, for example, what is very much important is non-dilutive capital. So we know the best agencies that can write applications for grants. Mm -hmm. So our companies increase their winning rates of non-dilutive capital. So they have more cash to be successful. So this is basically how after the investment, really the hard work uh, uh, starts. Yeah, it's more these days building an ecosystem than just treating it like like an investment. Right. Um, yeah, that's true. That makes a huge difference. Um, I hope that one day in Europe we will also have the the sequoias and Andreessen Andreessen's here around, and your fund is probably one of those. We we or... try to be the one for climate at least. Yeah, that's a good thing because I had uh, Sebastian Malaby a couple of months ago on my podcast, and he wrote very extensively. It's a very very yes. great book. He yes. wrote very extensively about the U.S. ecosystem in venture capital, and he spent, uh, I think, one third of the book on China and Asia. And then I asked the question to him, why not Europe? Because as I said, there is no venture capital here in Europe. <laughs> so that's basically it. But it's getting better. Um, do you see that uh, also Sequoia and, uh, and Andrews and Horowitz uh, have built ecosystems that... Uh, basically explains their success compared to European. We had European funds also in the 90s, but most of them don't exist anymore. Do you think this ecosystem thinking that you have makes this huge difference? By all means, I, I, I think that Andreessen was maybe the first one to really institutionalize the way they think. If you go to their website, you mm -hmm. see, I don't know, 200 people, um, <clears throat> because basically they build these um, integration or these teams the support teams internally basically mm -hmm. what we are using as as in, uh, uh, external resources we have mm -hmm. the go-to people whenever we want to uh, send our companies to someone they've uh, basically uh, insourced it to do it uh, in-house right um, and a lot of that is is about biz dev for example so if they have people that are doing business development for their companies so they talk to corporates and make uh, uh, introduction days for, for corporates to come and see the portfolio, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really full-time positions that those guys are paying for from the management fee. This is nothing that you can you know, ask the investors to pay. So this is our money that we pay in order to bring in more resources so that we can give back um, to our portfolio. And I think this is also, I mean, in this regard, we're a bigger team uh, in comparison to maybe the normal VC of our size. So you basically sacrifice your short-term gains against uh, your management fee to pay more people. Yes. Uh, to provide more services. So let's let's call it services. It's just a term. It's the first term that comes to my mind. To, to, to use that services for free, basically, for to drive your companies forward, to give your companies uh, a competitive advantage in the market. Exactly. Uh, I mean, in, in terms of Andrews and Horowitz, I think the success speaks for itself. So it's uh, it's undeniable that it works. That's the that's the hypothesis. Yeah. Oh, I think it definitely, <laughs> definitely. Okay. Um, let's look about the companies you're interested in um you are based in europe as far as i remember and you right. mentioned before the nordics and uk and germany uh which areas are you investing uh, ge geographical areas are you also investing in the united states or are you focused on europe sure so we're we're european fund um that means that most and we're denominated in euro so that means that uh, most of the stuff that we're doing let's say 60 percent of what we're doing is in Europe as in EU27, kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, Europe is a big definition. Um, <laughs> and coming from Israel, I, you know, we, we always ask, hey, is it including Israel or not, right? Sometimes Israel is Europe, sometimes Israel is not Europe, but all of a sudden the Brits are asking the same, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so generally, uh, uh, we invest anywhere geographically, anywhere between Israel on the east and the UK on the west and up to the Nordics, yeah? mm -hmm. be it in if they are using uh, euro or they're using crones. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's kind of of the space. But as I said, most of the stuff is in kind of in, in a hard in core Europe, so to speak. Um, we are looking at things in the states, um, but uh, we believe that the market there is very developed. So there should be a very good reason for us why to invest overseas. I mean, at the end of the day, and because of the stuff that we're doing and working very closely with our companies, the time zone is something not to be underestimated, the difference. Um, it's a very local uh, thing. So if we do do investment in the US, US it's probably not going to be where we're leading an investment. Mm -hmm. uh, one and two, it's because we, we had a look from a, from a topic perspective, we believe that this topic is very determinantal for climate change and the leader is in the States. So we want to invest uh, over there. So basically any company that is not in Europe uh, can easily solve the problem when they relocate or when they position their headquarter in Israel, in other European countries, in the United Kingdom, in the Nordics, so they can choose. And when they did so, then they are fit for in investing. I, I, I think we will have a look at any company from anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's just that we will not lead the deals in companies that are not in Europe. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be a very good reason why to invest in a different time zone. Okay. What is your preferred role? Do you want to lead the investment rounds or are you more the, the relaxed follower? I say? We do both. Yeah. So a lot of the time, so even when we're leading a round, the nature of this business of climate is that the rounds are bigger than maybe what we can take or they will be bigger than what we can take. Mm -hmm. as a single fund. And I believe that there is a lot of merits um, for syndication. So that's why we never take an entire round. We always leave room for followers. So maybe 60% of the time we will be the lead and others will follow, but 40% of the time it will be the other way around. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We will follow uh, someone else. Now syndication makes absolute sense in high stakes games, especially when the company is not yet fully to risk. Exactly. It's, it's a good thing. It's uh, also shareholders does not mean uh, uh, that there's just one owner. I mean, climate change is a huge topic. Uh, and with many different approaches, you mentioned hydrogen, we talked about electric, we talked about solar, then we have wind, uh, we have all kinds of developments, right. e fuels, for example, I think we tackled uh, right. briefly. What is your focus with Extancia? Are you open for every every development as long as uh, it has climate in it? Or do we have a narrowed down focus that you would like to see? Sure. In so, so, so basically, no, we, we, have, a, we have a focus. As I said, the, the climate stack where emissions are coming from is, is very broad. And basically what we're focusing on is on topics <clears throat> that are wherever we are seeing green electrons and green molecules. So that would be uh, most of the things that are generating energy. Energy generally is, is like, say, I mean, 75% of the problem is, is energy. You just dissect it into different topics like uh, electricity, heat, and fuel, right? So mm -hmm. across mobility, uh, construction, uh, industry at the end of the day boils back to, to energy. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're very uh, active. The others is uh, industrial processes. I mean, this is also this is the um, green molecules element. So we need to have uh, processes basically or materials that are doing things in a way that we source things not from dinosaur bones anymore, but rather from biomass or mm -hmm. circular yeah so we are using the c and in the h that is already in the system in order to create uh the hydrocarbons or the molecules that we um that that we need so these are kind of the uh, topics what does it exclude so for example um that means that we're not focusing on b2c topics we're not focusing on uh, biology. Yeah, most of the stuff is physics, chemistry, what we do. So less biology, less synthetic biology, alternative proteins. Um, 
these are also topics that we believe that in the essence of them require uh, behavioral change, consumer change. And again, as we said, we believe less in consumers to change, <laughs> but rather delivering a, a technology. So if we will do something in those area, we will probably be the, the follower. But the focus is really physics, chemistry, energy, mm -hmm. Uh, electron, electrons, green um, molecules. On top of that, basically, this is replacing or avoiding future emissions, basically, right? Mm -hmm. So this is all about changing the industry. We need to undo the past. And that's where we are very active in uh, CDR, carbon dioxide removal, uh, specifically in uh, in all types of removals, but most uh, specifically with um, direct air capture. Yeah, until the past, this is, uh, I think, a, a hard topic. Often when I think about the changes that you said, we basically, it means replacing entire infrastructures also. Uh, it means ripping or uh, just destroying the infrastructure that has been built over 150 years and then replace it uh, right. electro electric cars i mean the european commission said that we want to go electric mm -hmm. but it really means uh replacing the entire infrastructure and this is a huge task in my opinion. Yeah. that that is so, super interesting point that that you're touching and one that we're very adamant maybe even maybe religious about okay um we strongly believe in retrofits Mm -hmm. So whenever we can retrofit things, we think that this is much, much better for different reasons. Not for one, because of the time to impact, yeah, because it's faster. And a ton that is abated today is not equal a ton that would be abated tomorrow uh, because of all the side effects. Um, so everything that we can do faster is much better. The second is that if we need to build in new fleets of assets, be it cars, be it uh, plants, uh, um, be it airplanes, then the carbon, this is all being built with a current energy mix, right? So basically what we're doing is we're increasing our carbon debt. All this needs to be compensated. Mm. So maybe if you look at railway and driving railway today is, is zero emissions, but if you're putting a new track now, it's gonna take like 30, maybe even 50 years before this track is gonna be climate neutral. So if there is any chance that I can take, so everybody's talking about hydrogen-based uh, uh, airplanes. I'm not talking about electrical because these will never fly, literally, uh, long haul. Uh, but the hydrogen-based, um, the energy density, the volumetric energy density of hydrogen is way bigger than kerosene, than jet fuel. Mm -hmm. So you need more space. That means that if you want to have hydrogen-based airplanes, that's why you see all this futuristic uh, uh, stuff because you just need more space in the wings to, to store the hydrogen. That mm -hmm. means you need completely new fleets, right? But the fleets are either there or as we heard at the beginning, there will be built more. And the more capex these are there, the industry is not going to write it off. Mm -hmm. So it's on us to find solutions fast, how you can use existing infrastructure and retrofit it. That's why e-fuels, for example, uh, don't want to go into the discussion whether it's good for cars or not, but for airplanes, for example, is sustainable aviation fuel, it's a no-brainer mm. that this is the pathway that we have to go because Yes, maybe one day we'll have hydrogen-based plants, but that would make sense when we will all the current fleet will have to go out of service. And then in 50 years, we will start introducing hydrogen-based airplanes. Maybe it's going to be uh, fusion-based airplanes by then. But, um, but it makes no sense to start building infrastructure. That's why we believe that also uh, uh, the oil and gas industry 
is not going to disappear overnight just because we tell them, hey, guys, you're polluting, so stop doing this thing. We have to find a way to work with them to decommission or repurpose the mm. things that they're doing. So let's take a well, and instead of taking oil, what do you guys know to do best? Ah, you know to drill. So why don't you drill instead of uh, uh, two kilometers or five kilometers? Why don't you drill to 10 kilometers and get into geothermal? Right? So we can repurpose a lot of the stuff so that we don't have to build new stuff. Mm. So and the every, every, and, and, and that brings me, maybe summarizes the three criteria that we as a fund, we look at. Uh, that summarizes it very nicely. So one is how big the impact is mm -hmm. yeah, in absolute terms. Two, how fast, what is the time to impact that you have? And third, can you leverage existing assets? Can mm -hmm. you retrofit? How is it can be incorporated into existing uh, processes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very smart. This is something that's my sum. Good to hear that uh, there's, there's something behind this assumption. I did such a calculation a few years ago when I decided not to buy a Tesla. So it was one thing is, okay, I want to help the environment. I buy a Tesla and my driving behavior is basically uh, 2,000 kilometers per year. So it's not very much. I have a now 20-year-old diesel and it just did the calculation. So I mean, look, when I buy a new car, uh, I negatively impact the environment and much more than just continuing driving with the diesel for 2000 kilometers as long as it doesn't go up to 50 or 100 per year like commercial use cases uh to probably more good to the environment to use the existing asset and uh keep using it um compared to someone who replaces the car every year and put something on the auto by all means if you replace uh, and i'm doing the same mm -hmm. i have a zoe that is second hand and uh, which I'm leasing, and that's great. I also did just 2,000 kilometers uh, sometimes on the weekend, right? So mm. why do you need something new? Why do you have, this is talk, we're talking about consumptions. Yeah. Why change a car every two years, three years? Yeah, it's perfectly good. Yeah. If you are changing it, it means that you're replacing it for something new. You're creating the carbon debt again. And the return times on cars it depends on the calculation. If you're really fast, I would say three years. So mm -hmm. if you hold it for three years, maybe you just paid it back. Yeah, because it's not zero, right? Mm -hmm. And you can burn much more money better in venture capital or when you destroy <laughs> yeah. it on the stock market. Uh, I mean, this is a tricky question that I have to you now. I mean, you have a portfolio, so you are not a new fund with no portfolio. Uh, but we have a time limit, so we can't talk about eight hours um, to to show potential founders or LPs what kind of portfolio companies you have. Could you pick one uh, due to time constraints uh, to just exemplify what you said uh, and uh, talk a little bit about how you found the asset, why you decided to invest in the asset and what you did after the investment? Sure. So <clears throat> why don't we talk about uh, Magnotherm, for example? Mm -hmm. That's uh, uh, the latest uh, investment that we have done. So maybe less. Uh, we will talk a bit, li little bit less about uh, the post investment, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but more about what we have. So basically, we've known the company for three years, and what the company is doing is that they're reinventing the fridge. Uh, the fridge or any cooling system as we know it has been out there for anywhere between 150 to 100 uh, years. And every cooling system we know, be it an air condition, be it uh, a fridge, uh, they all work the same. It's about the basic uh, thermodynamics of, of gases. Mm -hmm. It's about the fact that gases, as they expand, they are releasing heat or basically you feel cool, right? So they absorb heat. And, and when you, then you put energy, you contract them, right? So there is heat. And again, there you have a cycle, right? So of cooling and, and heating. That involves one, a lot of energy. And two, that involves 
well, gases. And many of those gases are not good for the climate. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> basically what Magnotherm is doing, um, they're doing things completely different. There is a different phenomena in, in nature that there are elements out there that when you apply a magnetic field on them, well, the same thing happens. They either absorb heat, which is then you feel that it's cool, or they release heat. And if you put an engine around that, a magnetic engine mm -hmm. around that, then you can basically build a refrigerator. And that is called the magnetocaloric effect. It's been known for many years, over 100 years, but <clears throat> it, people struggled in order to commercialize it. And honestly, there was no incentive to do that because the real fridge, the, or the fridge as we know it, was so successful. But now, and this is, it epitomizes a lot of the stuff that we see. Because things were cheap, because energy was cheap, and it was mm -hmm. cheap not just because coal was cheap or because, yeah, because, because, because of the price, because, but nobody cared about the environmental side effects, right? So a lot of processes and things, how to do things were just neglected, neglected mm -hmm. because you had other ways. But now that you start thinking about it, all of a sudden, other ways that were neglected before can become the mainstream of tomorrow. And with magnetocaloric, uh, the way this magnetherm, they've managed to do that, not only you save 50% uh, of the energy, so every fridge basically, especially the big ones in supermarkets, mm -hmm. they need, because they consume a lot of energy because you open, close, right? Um, they, you can reduce the energy that they're using. So electricity consumption by 50%, but also because you're using magnets and you don't use gases, boom, you don't have the F gases question anymore. Mm -hmm. So together, this, this is a fundamental change to how we do uh, things. And as I said, this is epitomizes really the, the stuff we're looking for. That I said, we need to reinvent the wheel, literally, mm -hmm. right? We need to, re, to, to, to do things in the entire industry to do things very, very uh, uh, in a very different uh, in a very different way. Now with Magnetherm, so that's what they're doing. We've known the team for three years. They started with uh, very early. That was a lab prototype, and the goal was to build uh, uh, an engine that would supply that engine towards others that are manufacturers of refrigerators, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was very complex and. Basically, over the two years, we've worked with a, with a team to sharpen the go-to market mm -hmm. to the point in time that we thought, okay, the guys have done an amazing work, and you know, not everybody's listening. So the fact that that not everybody listens and executes. Mm -hmm. Um, so the fact that they've uh, uh, made that such an advancement was very notable. To the point in time that we decided to um, to invest, and now that we have invested, we're working on, uh, like we like to say, um, we don't take a good team and build a good product with them. We take a good team with a good product and help make that an excellent business. And that's what we're working now on: starting to sell and bring to the market and make it an, an amazing company. That's great. So basically, it fulfills your free criteria. It has a big impact. It's fast to market, basically. So you don't have to invest or wait 10 to 20 years. Right. So it's uh, the refrigerator is there. People use it. People need it. The need is defined. And when you just solve the problem of bringing it to the customer, you have a huge impact. So it's very fast. Exactly. And it leverages also existing technology. It doesn't create new needs. So it doesn't need... Uh, replacement of entire industries so they can use the logistics that exist already mm -hmm. the shops that exist already and it just replaces the old refrigerator that and, and, we used 
Exactly. And the interesting part, apart from the fact that all the parts, the, the magnets and everything can be recycled. So mm. one of the most amazing companies that I've seen that are thinking cradle to cradle, right? So entire life cycle, how do you not just build, but also dismantle and reuse um, is uh, the, the, the fact that uh, um, they're, they're bringing it to the market. And from day one, there is no premium. So the total cost of ownership is already because you use less gases, you, you use less electricity, the total cost of ownership, the, this thing is cheaper than buying a gas-based uh, really, refrigerator. Really? For the consumer? For the consumer, for the, for the supermarket. Uh, they don't look, so the CAPEX is higher, but the OPEX is much lower. And yes. and those refrigerators, you you look at the total cost of ownership. You don't look at just at the initial yeah. price. Yeah. So it's also for the household. Uh, you can do that also for the household, but that's not. I mean, that would be a big B two C. So they are talking mm -hmm. to all kinds of OEMs in this in this regard, uh, but it's not necessarily our first go to market. So basically, would need. Um... Uh, a license, a license deal, or something that the company steps in and says, "Okay, look, uh, I can bring it to the consumer, so that the license is technology." Exactly. I guess. I guess yeah, you, this would go via partnership. Mm -hmm. So it's the typical P 2 P model that you're looking for. Exactly. Exactly. It's good to know for founders. Um, I found your profile uh, via LinkedIn, and maybe we move to the to the to the founders yeah. part. And uh, I got curious in one of your posts where you showed me, let me just, maybe I can flash it uh, quickly. Let me just... so. Um, yes, this one, it's this one. And so it was this post mm -hmm. where you said uninvestable cap tables. And let's talk a little bit about founders' mistakes and focus on the on cap tables in the discussion. Uh, it's a topic that I see very often uh, when founders approach me and say, can you help us uh, find investors and uh, tell the story better? And they look at the cap table and you see something uh, yeah. like, like this here. Yeah. Uh, for example, I had a cap table once with uh, a studio that owned 80% of the company mm. with uh, the founders uh, part-time working mm. in their old jobs. And I said to them, look, I mean, it's really difficult to find investors for that because uh, there is no incentive for the founders to move it forward. They have their jobs. Why should they dedicate their lives? And one time when I tried to found a company, I, had, uh, I was in discussion with a license deal from a university. And the university then said, uh, we want 90% of the equity. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I should bring in the money. I should bring in the team. And you request 90% of the equity. So what incentive is there for the founding team? And it was a long discussion and they changed their opinion then in that. And it's very good. To, it's really good to see that an investor puts out a chart explaining the uninvestable cap tables. I would be interested in your uh, opinion and your words. Why do you see that as uninvestable for, uh, for the, from the investor perspective? Sure. So first of all, this, this was born out of a lot of frustration. Yeah, uh, that you are getting excited about about the company, about the technology, about the team, and then you start to dig deeper and you say, "Okay, can you share your cup table?" And then all of a sudden, you're like, "Ooh, well, what is that?" Right? Because this is not the first thing that you're asking from mm -hmm. from from a company. Um, the thing is that when you invest. You invest in the future. You're not investing in the, in the past. Basically, a lot of people contributed. So there were many people and many fathers and mothers uh, to this baby, yeah? mm -hmm. especially if it's a successful one. Um, then there are many people that were doing something and they are all somewhere on the cap table. But some of them were very fundamental to the birth of the company or mm -hmm. to the earlier stage of the company and will no longer be relevant for the future. 
and the current value of the company is is maybe X, but you know, when we're as VCs, we're investing, we want to see it not 10 X, we want to see at least a hundred X on the value creation. So basically the majority of the value is yet to be created. And as we discussed, this is a lot of hard work. So we want to make sure that those who are going to create that value are well incentivized and are able to execute on that plan. And these are two different things, yeah? So we need to make sure that they have the incentive and that they are able to to execute. And the incentive is going back to ownership. They have to have enough ownership. And the ability to execute is governance. And if we see like, like one of those examples that you've shown, one investor, okay, so you think it's nice, it's okay, maybe it's one investor and maybe that investor doesn't even have more than 30% of the cap table, but that investor came with, I want to have veto rights on everything. And maybe and that investor is, that in itself is not great, but if that investor is also a high net worth individual that is also always on the yacht and you cannot get a hold of her or him to get signatures, to execute, you're 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 paralyzed. You cannot mm-hmm. work like that. So, and 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 this is all real stories. <laughs> yeah, we we've seen everything. So you need to make sure that the future. If you look at the cap table, you need to make sure that there is a future value creation ability in in the cap table. And quite often, you do all types of mistakes in the beginning. And like the second uh, law of thermodynamics, you know, uh, uh, once you unleash it, it's very hard to undo something. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you can try, but it's difficult. Mm. It's a lot of energy to put it back. Um, so when we are, so now, and many people ask me, so it's not necessarily that we drop the ball if we see these types of cup tables. Uh, if the company, if we are excited about it, and again, company may be a successful, company may be good company, but if you want VC money, it needs to be VC ready. It's like myself that I need, I need to be institutional ready. If I want money from institutionals, I need to be institutional ready. I need to play their game. If you want money from VC, you need to play the VC game and the cap table needs to be. If you don't want money from VC, Maybe the cap table is completely okay and you can mm-hmm. continue doing whatever you do. But if you want money from VC, it needs to look in a certain, it needs to look in a certain way. And then what we try to do is clean up. Yeah. And clean up, there are all kinds of ways to do that. Secondaries, dilution of uh, non-active members, uh, issuing more ESO. There are a few cards in the sleeve, not many. <laughs> But there are a few things you can try to do. But, but, but there is a lot of tax tax implications and yeah. it's, it's usually not easy, so easy. And the opportunity must be absolutely worth it. So it uh, exactly. just uh, sets the hurdle a little bit higher. It, than it's time cons- exactly. It's time consuming and there is a lot of emotions involved. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is something that's fun. I mean, the from 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 my experience, I mean, the, the advice I give to startups usually is uh, the cap table is the cap table because it shows the people who can can bring capital to the table uh, <laughs> repeatedly and the over and one. over again. So make sure that people who are on the cap table uh, really can provide more capital in future when you need it yeah. to grow your operations and. Don't put people on the cap table just because they are friends or you like them or you need them for a year. For example, lawyer, legal advice, it's good, it's necessary, but rather pay them in cash yeah. than hand equity out to them. Right. And some founders then say, don't worry, it's so easy. Uh, investors don't have a problem with that because they can simply buy the shares of those parties. Uh, do you buy shares basically from, uh, from, from, you said a zoo of investors, for example, you have 20 advisors who then say, yes, give us our 10x return now and you can have all shares. Well, 
it's not unheard of, mm. right? But it really depends. In in growth stage, it's much more common mm. that you do a hundred million round, and then ten million out of that, or I don't know, five million out of that goes to secondaries. Mm. But if you're doing a five million round, we cannot allocate a million or two million out of that for secondaries because secondaries is money that is not going into the company, mm -hmm. right? So we cannot now invest instead of five, invest seven. So it has to come from the overall sum. And at an early stage, we would rather see as much money as possible going into into the company rather than buying out somebody, right? Now, we may do that if it's um, a mean to an end. Mm. Uh, we want to clean up the copy. Maybe um, we want to get a blended valuation because we buy preferred shares at a certain price and then seed shares or, or common shares at a certain other price, yeah? And then we get a blended valuation on our holding. Um, so it's not unheard of, but it's also like, it's not the first thing that we would love to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same picture that I got. Um, the training I got in the VC-funded companies I worked uh, 20 years ago, uh, almost 20 years, 17 years ago, was that there are only two liquidity events. It was pharma, basically truck development. Mm -hmm. And there was very clear and said, look, I mean, if, if an angel investor puts in any money, it's not our problem. There are two liquidity events. You have an IPO or an acquisition. Right. And that's it. And if they can't bring capital to the table, <laughs> right. then they get diluted. And there was absolutely no interest in buying at early stages for the sole reason that you described it. I say we want to put our capital to work in the company. Exactly. And when we have to buy shares, the capital is that basically for our LPs. It doesn't work anymore. Exactly. Exactly. So Sorry. it it has to be really in very outstanding cases that we would use this type of uh, mechanism. So basically, what advice would you give to founders then when it comes to cap table to for for the majority of the cases? Because I think the outstanding when we look at the bell curve, we have uh, small percentages left and right, but the majority of the cases, what advice would you give to founders? So I think the most important thing is vesting. Um, let's put it that way. The likelihood that, you know, if three guys, four guys uh, are, are coming together out of university and are starting a company that all of you are going to stay forever uh, and even forever can be even after for more than a year <laughs> together um, is not high. Mm. Okay, I don't have the statistics right now, but a lot of things change. The company pivots, life pivots, uh, things change. And what you want to avoid is people leaving and still holding a lot of shares. If people are not active, you they shouldn't be having more than two percent, yeah, something like something like that. And that's why you have to make sure from day one to put uh, vesting on 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 the shares. That's one thing. The other is if you bring in business angels, and each one 10k 50k all these small tickets and by the way some of them will be able to bring in capital in kind in the future some of them capital and some of them capital in kind so some of them can really make a difference for the company over the lifetime of, of the company but quite fast you have like five, 10 names that are advisors or whatever angels over in the cap table. You really don't want to run after these guys for signatures. Yeah. And really depends where you are in the States. It's mm. easier with signatures and majority in Europe. Sometimes quite often you need signatures from everybody. 
um, and even from minor shareholders. So the best advice I have here is pooling. All these people, choose one that is trusted from with everybody else and just do pooling voting. If there mm -hmm. is a conflict of interest topic, you can go back. But for the vast majority of signatures, that person can sign for everybody. So pooling is definitely uh, um, a recommendation that I would say um, to, to, to bear in mind. The other element maybe uh, to those that are coming out of universities, mm -hmm. uh, when you negotiate IP transfer with universities is no matter what you give them on. So if, if you, th th there are two ends, right? Either equity or royalties and a combination, right? So if this, if you give equity, only equity or a lot of equity, then royalties should be zero. If you give higher royalties, then equity should be zero. Don't do, don't, don't let them rob you on, on both ends. And if you do give equity, that equity should be subject to dilution. Mm -hmm. So you would be surprised how many universities are asking, okay, we have 10% and we will have 10% on after even after a series D, we will still have 10%. So this yeah. anti-dilution mechanism is, is a nightmare. So never agree to something uh, like that. Now, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I don't like TTOs having equity for, for one reason. The, I mean, it's academic background. And these institutions are set up to exist forever. And uh, in cases when the company doesn't work, it's no problem. Right. But let's plan for success and not for failure. In terms of success, the person that I may have been good friends with uh, at the time of the signature of the contract is definitely not the person who will sit there when I right. negotiate a Series A. And who knows? God knows who will be there. I mean, it's an academic environment. This might be someone who never did any investment before. And then you have to train this person into an investment thinking and exactly. uh, they can hold up everything. As I said, I mean, they can destroy a series A round and say, okay, we don't accept that. Uh, royalty is usually much easier to handle um, from the terms when it comes to investment, right. other, other things. But uh, my opinion is still cap table is for people who can bring money to the table period. <laughs> so I, with your permission, I will adopt it. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> sure. Feel free. <laughs> And then you also mentioned this. Uh, there is this nice song currently in, in on Spotify, at least. I don't know if it's in the charts, but one line is, uh, it goes like, uh, it, it's funny, like people, be, uh, people start as strangers, then become friends, and friends become lovers and strangers again. <laughs> and they always think about investing. I mean, you start with people, you come out of university, you're best friends, then you meet investors, and it's sort of kind of falling in love. And at one point in time, this tips. So it's just life. And what was a love affair must not last in an eternal relationship. It can also break up. Yeah. And when you have then this, uh, you call it a zoo of investors on the cap table with 60% yeah. of investors really hating the team, it might be tricky to get new investors on board. Yeah. And, and you know, I've had, I've had cases that the main challenge was just to get an agreement between the investors. Mm -hmm. So three VCs, each one had like 10% of, of the company. So it would, there was no clear leader. And, you know, we all like to think that we're very smart. So you have smart three VCs, each one. One is at the beginning, uh, did this investment from the beginning of the fund. Mm -hmm. The last one did it from the, uh, uh, last investment of the fund, five years down the road, they have different interests. And maybe even one of the, fund, the investors that have done the investment, she is no longer there. So there is someone else. It doesn't mean that just because it, it's three VCs, in, in, in interests are aligned. But if you don't have a clear lead and someone that holds enough, and then it's not enough in equity. So even if you put all the hard work you're not being compensated. Mm. It just leads to endless amount of the, then there is a negative correlation, right? So it's minus one on the correlation between the amount of discussion 
and the amount of value creation. Yeah. <laughs> so, and this founder should uh, should look after keeping that in check so that they increase the stakes of future rounds. The amount of time that I've seen investors and, and founders fighting over a zero <laughs> is, is just enormous. Yeah. That's Whereas true. if you agree fast, there is a chance to make something on the from this zero. But if you don't, it's continue fight. It's a zero, and it's uh, it takes time from value creation. Exactly. All, all, this, all this fighting, all these discussions, it's not time used for moving the company forward. Exactly. <laughs> it's just politics. Uh, yeah, yeah. I had just had uh, I had to check the time. Uh, we have six minutes left because you said you have at 2.30 your next meeting and sure. we are in Central European time. It's really great talking to you. Uh, let me ask you a few final questions about the future of your fund. Uh, what role do you see Extancia Capital play in Europe's climate tech landscape in the coming years? Well, I, I hope that uh, one of our, you know, we're investing in a portfolio of companies and in each of, each of, uh, of those companies, uh, you know, we say that uh, instead of just being a unicorn, we want them to abate a gigaton. Um, so these are, as, as it was coined, like a gigacorns. Mm -hmm. So we would love to have that one of our companies at the end of the day that we can come in 30 years time and say, you see that technology? You see these lithium ion batteries? That was the company that we uh, we backed and helped scale these types of solutions that one day this will be a household, the technology will be a household technology as much as we're talking today about fuel cells, PV, or lithium ion batteries. That's a great vision. Let me build on that with the final question. Uh, if Extancia Capital's work is successful, and after 20 years, you look back and you say your work is done, um, how would the world look like? Mm -hmm. What changes and advancement would you see in your fight against climate change? I think is every time we tried as humanity um, to make a prediction on how the future is going to look like, we failed. We but it's but failed. it's fun. But it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> I I think the future is going to be different in things that we cannot even imagine. Mm -hmm. um, Take uh, mobile phones. Yeah? There is this famous uh, adoption rate. Uh, I don't know if it was a McKinsey uh, um, uh, report that adopted it's going to take 20 years before some people are going to have penetration of one. And then mm -hmm. within a decade, the penetration was two per person. So um, I, I think that in many cases, we will see major, major differences. For example, I think that at the end of the day, energy is going to be ubiquitous, is going to be free. Mm -hmm. um, we will find solutions so that countries that are today very dominant on power because it's oil and gas or minerals. I mean, it's not uh, the, the geopolitics are just shifting now between one topic to another topic. Um, but eventually, I think that we will be energy independent. And that's uh, going to be um, a game changer on the geopolitical uh, level. I think all, many of the wars we see today are because of energy, boils down to energy. Mm. And my wish is, is that we will see much more peace in the future, thanks to ubiquitous uh, and cheap energy. I couldn't agree more. That's a great vision to end uh, this recording with driving down the energy cost to zero, making it available to everybody, uh, the green version of energy, so that exactly. we save our planet. It's a very great vision. Amen. Yeah, yeah. thank <laughs> you very much for this for this great conversation. Thank I you. love your vision. Uh, all the best to you and your team. Keep doing your important work and drive down the energy cost and create a peaceful world for our kids. Thank you, Christian. It's been a pleasure. Have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>